Thank you, everybody. Um, you have to forgive me, but I've got to use my iPad for my notes because I have something called baby brain, which means my capacity to remember anything uh, is, well, it's non-existent. So <laughs> I'm going to be reading, and I'll try and engage with you as much as possible. Um, there's a very simple phrase that I'll share with you today. It is a sentence that my father, this is my father here, he has a massive mustache, as you can see. <laughs> My father said to me countless times, this particular phrase he repeated throughout my life. At first, it made me roll my eyes with annoyance when he used it to teach me what I needed to change about my attitude, because of course I was young and I thought I didn't need to change at all, I knew everything. Um, but as I grew older, I started to realize that it was motivating me to do more than I thought I could. and. It even started to force me to question the decisions that I was making. So the phrase is, you got to have fire in your belly. And he said this to me my entire life. You got to have fire in your belly, Eileen. And what it means is that at your core, you must be passionate, uh, excited, and exceptionally determined about whatever you are investing your time or effort into. And if you aren't, You'll be wasting your time, directionless, you'll let others down, and really you won't be successful if you don't have that. Without fire in your belly, something integral is missing. So I'm going to give you a few lessons here today. And the first one is try everything. When I look back at my childhood, one thing stands out. I tried everything. Tap dancing, basketball, <laughs> synchronized swimming, Pottery, volleyball, badminton, painting, piano, hockey, trumpet, uh, student council, horseback riding, summer camp, jewelry making, woodworking, photography, and I'm sure many more things I'm forgetting. Uh, now, I didn't necessarily do all of these activities over long periods of time, much to my parents' frustration. They would groan when I announced that I wanted to move on to something new. And rightly so, as they invested time and money into my being able to do every one of those activities. Uh, some activities only retained my attention for a few months, while others, like organized sports, became a foundation of sorts in my youth. It was particularly around organized sports that my dad would say, you got to have fire in your belly. I give much credit to my parents for allowing me to have so many different experiences when I was younger. I was lucky to be able to discover what I loved, what I didn't, and what I might want to pursue. I think my mom inspired my creativity and versatility. That's my mom. She has a similarly wide range of interests. She's an amazing gardener. She did all sorts of creative hobbies like stained glass making and pottery. And she even sweated out on larger things like laying all the intricate stonework in our driveway. She was a role model for me in that way, a strong and talented lady. It can be daunting to learn something new, but you are rewarded not only in what you learn, but you're also feeding your curiosity and acknowledging your passions and most importantly, learning a lot about who you are and what you're capable of. So for those of you that are heading off to university, and maybe you didn't try all these crazy things in your childhood, it's not too late. When I went to university, I tried more new things. I co-hosted a weekly radio show. I took creative writing classes and had a few of my poems published. I played varsity rugby and volleyball. I took Latin dance classes. I started out actually as an English lit major, and then halfway through my degree, I switched to a fine arts major. And when I graduated from university, my art pieces were judged uh, first place in my class's final art show. And this was significant to me because I was never seen as the artistic child in my family. Uh, my brother was. And he's an exceptional artist. He always was, and I admire him very greatly. Or just greatly. <laughs> in some ways, I didn't pursue my love for art to the full extent because I thought I would never be as good as my brother Benjamin. So I didn't try as hard there. And it wasn't until I'd gone off to university and developed more of my own personal identity that I really allowed myself to try. And I realized that I had the fire in my belly for creative production. And I had all my life 
I just never let myself really try. At the end of my time at Bishop's University, I was awarded a solo art show for my future works at an art gallery in Montreal. Now let's talk about failure. There never was a show. I moved to Toronto and started working in an art store with just enough money to pay my rent and feed myself. I was asked by the gallery that had awarded me the show to produce um, about 50 pieces in a few months. And that would require a lot of money. And as a new university graduate, I had none. Um, so I did start working though. I tried my best. And what I was doing was actually painting on people's naked bodies and writing poetry and then photographing the piece. Other art artists modeled for me for free. My brother helped me fund part of the project and I slowly produced more and more work. But I didn't have the means to do it fast enough and the gallery eventually fell through. I was disappointed, but I still see that as a process of great success. I have about 40 pieces that I've never shown, that I've never done anything with, and some might say that's a waste, but for me it was a great experience. I failed, and that's okay. Um, it wasn't the end of the world. I was 21, um, and everything was yet to come, just as many of you are. I struggled, I learned, I produced something I was proud of and passionate about. I did what I loved. I was an artist. People are so afraid to fail, and I know you've heard this already today, that it stops them from even trying something in the first place. But we must try and do the things we want, despite our fears of failure. Because I think that's actually the best part. Not knowing what will come, and having the courage to adapt, grow, and persevere as you continue down a path that may not be certain in its outcome, but a path that you are certain you want to pursue. Many people define success with money, status, and I have to say that is particularly true here in Malaysia. But to me, success is accomplishment, self-satisfaction, and pride. And those things exist in any career, completely independent of money or titles. So let's fast forward a little bit. I became a teacher, and I immediately started teaching English in Canada when I was 23. And people always ask, you know, did you always want to be a teacher? Did you always know that? No, I had no idea that I actually wanted to be a teacher until I actually was one. And the reason I went into teaching was because I thought teaching would allow me to continue to explore all the things that I like to do and more new things. And it would also allow me to work with people. And I valued that. Uh, I realized I loved teaching. Every day, I was exposed to different cultures and ideas through my students. I was able to be creative in a different way with thinking and planning. I also started coaching a variety of sports teams, investing a lot of time into starting a boys volleyball program, which my school did not have. I had the privilege of coaching almost the same group of young men for four years. And we went from losing almost every game in our first year to being undefeated in our last year. And I attribute most of that to a certain idea. Got to have fire in your belly. And that's how I coached. And it helped us be successful. So deciding to leave Canada, my job, my students, friends, and most importantly, family, was an incredibly difficult decision. I had a job that literally thousands wanted. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Canada there's a huge kind of teacher surplus. Uh, two out of three new teachers are unemployed or underemployed. So there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people that wanted the job that I had. And I could have kept it until I retired and lived very comfortably, but I chose to resign. And some of my friends and family were a little worried about me. My students lamented that I was doing something crazy uh, they were upset that I was leaving, but they also had difficulty understanding why someone would make such a big change in their life. For the most part, young people in almost any country are not taught to consider the quality of their experiences, the greater impact they can have on community or environment, 
at least not when it comes to choosing a profession. So when I told them I was leaving, in their eyes, I was walking away from the definition of success, money, security, community, and walking into the unknown to a country many of them had never heard of, Malaysia. They were baffled, so I tried my best to explain it to them. I didn't want to spend the next 30 years driving through traffic for hours every day in a huge city where I didn't really feel like I belonged. I didn't want to teach in a school where money and results trumped people and real learning experiences. I wanted to see the world. I tried to explain all the wonderful opportunities that might come out of my decision to leave. And as best they could, I think they started to understand. When I left, they wrote me beautiful goodbye cards, and many of them said things like, I will always have a fire lit in my belly and never lose the fire in your belly. I've kept in touch with some of my old students, and through our conversations, and even some of the decisions they are making, I see them starting to see the larger picture for themselves. One of my sisters, Uh, Megan gave me a gift this year that made me realize that the choices I had made to leave Canada were understood. She's 22 and she's just graduated from Mount Allison University, which is in Canada. She is an incredibly talented writer. She recorded this spoken word piece she had written about me. And I'd like to share it with you as it describes some of what I'm trying to say here today, but much more capably. We're not really the same. Sometimes you drive me crazy with the way you're two points northeast of what I'm trying to say. You threw a volleyball at my face once because you didn't want me to be afraid. My sister, you've got eight years on me. Eight years I can never touch, always playing catch up. You accuse me of cheating at Boggle when I know words you don't, but you will always have been places I have yet to go. Been places, yes, I associate you with motion because if there's one thing you've taught me, it's how to cross an ocean or a continent, how to open a door and get out. Leaving is never easy, because leaving is something you do for yourself. I watched you move to Quebec and become unspun, away from the pressure you'd lived in. I watched you walk away from people you loved, because love isn't everything, it's not beyond and above. I watched you leave the country for something brand new, and you lit up with more than a hotter sun. I watched you leave and leave and leave. But you live life like the tide, going out, coming in, touching everything. And you came back, came back, came back. So when I leave, I know how to dig up my roots and take them with me. How to shake the soil off and still keep blooming. I know how to keep moving, because being comfortable isn't everything. And it's not about staying versus walking away. I know how to pick my shoes for how many miles they'll take me. Because it's an incredible distance from my door to yours. And back again, and back again, and back again. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> So she had been paying attention all along and she learned through my experiences with me just as I had. And I felt proud that I had, I think, given her a bit of courage, courage to go out and try and do. Um, so I accepted a job in a country I even knew mostly nothing about, which was Malaysia. I didn't know I'd be able to travel, I knew there were good people here, and I knew it was a good school. But I also knew that it was a risk, an adventure. Um, but I didn't make that decision haphazardly. I didn't just wake up one day and decide I'm going to move to Malaysia. And so I'm going to speak about my father again, who also taught me how to make good decisions. And he really taught me that when it was my turn to decide where to go to university. And in order to make that decision, there was a process that I had to go through. And I basically had to choose about 15 universities across Canada and start to make a list of everything that I wanted to get out of university. Okay, things like school spirit or class size, quality professors, everything that I valued. And then put those in categories. And then research and find data for all those 15 universities, find actual evidence so I could rank each university in each of those categories. And then once I had done that, we assigned the numerical value to the wants and a numerical value to the needs. 
And then there was an equation so that everything got calculated. And in the end, there were three schools that would come out numerically on top. And then I had to go visit those schools in person, go on tours, talk to professors, uh, get as much real life information as I could. And finally then I can make a decision. And it took months to do this. And I thought my dad was crazy. And this is completely unnecessary. But in the end, I made the right decision. And that decision was based on research and facts, but also my own priorities and um, my own intuition when I actually went to the schools in person and got a sense of what I liked or didn't like. And so now when I make decisions, sometimes I go through a similar process. if It's a very large decision. Uh, but even when I don't, I have that framework kind of as part of me. And I know how to decide very quickly what's crucial and what's not. And that's because I learned it and I practiced it. And many people think making a good decision means making a safe decision or choosing something that is known, that's in front of them. And so they decide not to do something simply because they don't know what's going to happen or what will come. But good decision making is about learning and it takes effort and it also takes imagination. So I landed in Malaysia and it was very, very hot. <laughs> and I started teaching and traveling. I bought a motorbike. And overall, I felt very happy and at home here. I've been here for two and a half years. And although I still feel like a stranger in many ways, I've also learned a lot about the country and its people. And also quite a bit about the education system. So my students do not have very favorable things to say about their time in public school. They've explained to me what sounds like a system that directs students in a straight line. And it's mostly about learning, memorization, and regurgitation. Sitting at a desk and writing tests. I'm sure there's a lot of knowledge available in a system like that, but I question how much learning is actually happening. At CPU, where I'm a lecturer, uh, we offer a very different experience to our students. They have to demonstrate their skills through a variety of tasks, and they have to work together and accomplish learning goals. And many of our students describe their experience as transformational, something they've never experienced before, and they're often sad to graduate. In many ways, I think we empower our students to see a completely different path. And in some cases, students have the courage and dedication to then choose their own path. But let's talk about what comes after PreU for a moment. Last year, a very bright young girl said something shocking to me, one of our students. She's, I believe, currently on scholarship studying engineering in Canada right now. And she said that women needed to be married and raising a family by the time they are 30, despite their education, career goals, even personal goals. And I had to laugh because at the time I was like 29 and 3 quarters and uh, wasn't married and <laughs> didn't have a family. <clears throat> and I had to laugh because she is a great kid and I hope that her time in Canada will allow her to see that there are other acceptable life paths for women. But I want to talk about girls for a moment. Everywhere, not just Malaysia, girls are not taught to be leaders. They are not shown successful female role models. In many countries and many occupations, they are paid less for men paid less than men for the same job. They are trained to be subservient and really to attend others before themselves. And this needs to change. We need to talk to and treat young girls like we do boys and men. To dream, to be ambitious, to be leaders. That's really the key word, to be leaders. And then we need to give them the opportunities and support to fulfill their goals. Because as it stands right now in Malaysia, uh, boys and girls have identical, equal opportunities and access to education. That is true and that is great. But what comes after, support from society, the media, your family, it's not the same. And there are still some of the brightest you know, young people in Malaysia who happen to be female that think despite all that, 
there's still only one path for them. So I want to say to all girls and women, don't settle. Don't settle for anything less than what you want, not for a job, a partner, a place, nothing. Choose what you want, not what you are told you should want. And I want to make it clear that there's nothing wrong with wanting marriage and a family. That is certainly not settling, and it's what most of us want in our lives. But it should be a choice and not an expectation. But back to Malaysia. Here I found great people to work with, with new friends and traveling all over Southeast Asia, and then some. But the very best thing I found in Malaysia was Randy Rose. <laughs> Randy Rose is my best friend and the love of my life. <laughs> With his love and support, I have continued to do all the things I've been talking about today. Trying new things, exploring new places. He helped me overcome my biggest fear, an intense and irrational fear of singing on stage. And together we have worked on many huge projects and felt the joy of accomplishment through events like the Taylor's Talent Show and the CPU yearbook, where I've also rediscovered my passion for art and design. Having someone in your life that encourages you to do what you are passionate for and capable of, even when you are afraid or uncertain, is invaluable. And for many people, that support is only possible through family. You may have noticed, if you've been listening, that I've spoken about almost every member from my family today. And that's because I believe that is really what it all comes down to. This is my whole family, my grandma and sister-in-law. Um, it all comes down to family. And if you can have the support of your family, then you'll feel much more empowered to do the things that you're passionate about or that you're capable of. And the one member of my family that I've not yet mentioned is Kelsey. And this is Kelsey. She's 13. She's actually coming to visit me in a week, and I'm very excited. And she's my youngest sister. She calls me Eileen the Bean, and I call her Kelsey Bean. And she is certainly full of beans, if you know that phrase. She loves to be dramatic, and she loves to entertain everyone that's around her. So she's told us, her family, that she wants to be an actor when she grows up. And that's a difficult career or profession. It's not easy. And so instead of discouraging her, um, we've said, OK, we'll support you. And I know that if she really wants to pursue that path, that she has the ability and the determination to be successful. I imagine that it's very difficult to balance your desire for your child to be happy and passionate with your desire for your child to simply be OK and self-sufficient. But I think if we teach children all through their life what hard work is, help them find their true talents, and give them the opportunities to be successful, that they will succeed in the career they choose. But it's a process that we must be mindful of as we nurture them through many stages into adulthood. As you can see, I'm about to be a mother. So I'm starting to understand that process, but I also acknowledge that I have a lot to learn. But Randy and I will do our best to give our little girl the opportunities I've talked about. And we will try and make sure she knows that if she works hard, takes risks, makes good decisions, follows her talents, and finds that fire in her belly, then she will be able to do anything. Thank you.